Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala sayyidil mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi yajma'in. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wahduhu la sharika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Qala ta'ala fi kitabil aziz. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع والنقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا إن لله وإنا إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم سلعي عليهم سلوات من ربهم ورحمة وأولئك هم المحتدون أما بعد أيها الناس اتقوا الله فإن تقوى رأس كل شيء اتقوا الله وأتيوه وراقبوه. Today I want to speak about something which is pretty mediocre, pretty bland. And that is the issue of not fearing to be ordinary. It's the topic of living an ordinary life. Not an extraordinary life, not a life of a celebrity, not a life of a millionaire or anything as glamorous as that. Just simply living an ordinary life. Now, those of you who are of roughly my age or older or maybe just a few years younger will not have any great problem with this because as we were growing up, um, there was no great aspiration that was constantly being told to us, be more than what you are, be more than what you can be. But somewhere between then and now, The message of society, the message of school and teachings, the message of TV and advertising, the message of films and music, the message, the message, the message was that you can be anything that you you choose to be and do not choose to be ordinary. Aim for celebrity status, aim for this, aim for that. Aim for something that will make your life glamorous. And even some of us elders brought into that, such that we now fear, and this is society as a whole, society as a whole, exceptions of course, we now fear that my life is going to be mundane and ordinary. God forbid that I don't have those exciting holidays. God forbid I have no pictures and videos that I can show to my grandchildren of me climbing Mount Everest or something like that. God forbid, <coughs> when, even when I go to Hajj or Umrah, Hajj or Umrah, that I don't go to the tourist ex- um, attraction places and don't take a selfie with me and the Kaaba. Or better still, can there be something better? Me and the clock tower. God forbid I should miss out on those moments. God forbid that my life should be ordinary. In Greek mythology, and it's become part of the kind of Western psyche, there is the story of Sisyphus. Sisyphus is a king uh, who kind of disobeyed, quote unquote, the gods. And so he was punished by the gods, stripped of his kingdom, stripped of his authority, and condemned to roll a giant boulder up a huge hill with all the toil and the struggle that it involves pushing this boulder up a huge hill and as it gets to the top of the hill it rolls back down again and Sisyphus has to go back down and push the boulder up up the hill and it reaches the top and it rolls back down again for eternity. Sisyphus pushing the boulder, a pointless task it seems, for eternity. That was his punishment. And it kind of becomes a symbol, or it has been used by some as a symbol to to say that that's how ordinary life is about. Ordinary life is pointless until you make it extraordinary. Ordinary life is pointless until you make it glamorous or celebrity. But what does the Quran say? 
Surely as Muslims, when ideas are thrown at us or whenever we encounter ideas of the mind or the art, Surely, as Muslims, we should have at least this common religious sense, common understanding or religious sense to say, hold on, that's a nice idea, it sounds good, but how does it measure up against what Allah says? I don't need to be a scholar as such to ask that question, though I might need to ask a scholar for some of the details of that answer, but the basic way of life, the basic aspirations of a mu'min, of a believer, a believing man or a believing woman, is something that the Qur'an makes plain to everybody. One can, doesn't even have to be a Muslim. One could be a non-Muslim and somehow listen to the message of the Qur'an, read the Qur'an in translation in general, and kind of get the message of what, Allah, what type of life Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants a believer to have, and what is the attitude to life? Does Allah say that life is a bit like Sisyphus rolling that, pushing that huge boulder up the stone only for it to roll down again and it's just mundane, dreary and pointless? No, some atheists might say so, existentialists might say so. But that's not really how the believer looks at life. The believer doesn't look at life that it has to be glamorous in the secular, consumeristic, modern sense. There's no reason we need to buy into that lie or into that myth, that modern myth. And yet, on the other hand, one of the key messages of the Qur'an is sa'ada, is happiness, tumanina, tranquility inner peace, joy of the soul. On the one hand, we don't see life as just like Sisyphus, pointless, mundane, and we just have to go through these tasks. And we, the only way we can get out of it is to make life glamorous and chase after things that people chase after. And on the other hand, seeking happiness and inner joy or inner contentment is something that the Qur'an expects the human being to want because it's there in us by fitra, by innate disposition, seeking our well-being and happiness is ingrained in the human condition, it's ingrained in the Adamic man or woman. But Allah SWT says, going to the verse that I recited, the beginning of the khutbah, and we shall surely test you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and loss of uh, life and a, a loss of living and fruits. But give glad tidings to those who patiently persevere and carry on. Those who patiently persevere and carry on. Who are they? <laughs> they are those who, whenever they are struck with a hardship, a calamity, or even a misfortune, they say, <laughs> To God, to Allah do we belong, and to Him shall we return. And what is the reward of such people? <laughs> Upon such people will be Allah, salawat uh, uh, will be blessings from Allah, wa rahma, and His mercy. <laughs> they, and they alone, are the rightly guided ones, are the guided people. Why are they guided? Because they understand that life will not be all glamorous. Why are they rightly guided and rewarded so much and so well and spoken so highly of? Because they understand when calamities strike, it's part of the greater divine plan. And that all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants of me is to act responsibly and act patiently. Do the right thing, ward off the harm, recuperate the loss if need be. 
but do so in a way whereby the tongue and the limbs don't complain against Allah, don't become agitated, don't lose composure, don't lose patience or sabr. Sabr isn't just to let destiny pass us by and say, okay, that's it. I lost my wealth. I lost this. I lost that. I failed to achieve this. Give up. We don't do that. As Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jilani used to say, the believer fights destiny. What does that mean? It doesn't literally mean fight destiny. That's kind of impossible, right? What is written is written. But it is that when destiny unfolds itself in something bitter for us, we do the normal, responsible human thing and try to change that bitterness into sweetness. If we, cut, if we feel that a cold, a, a cold or flu is coming along, we don't just say, Qadr Allah, this is Allah's Qadr, I was meant to have a flu. No, I mean, if I sneeze once or twice and I think a flu is coming along, maybe I wrap up warm. Of course I trust in Allah. And if it comes and afflicts me, it was never going to pass me by. But it hasn't afflicted me yet. I seem to have the first symptoms. But I don't say, oh, that is my qadr. Because I don't know what will happen in the next few hours. I might get a cold. But I am required to be responsible. Wrap up warm, take a hot drink or whatever it be. If it goes, it wasn't meant to be. If it comes even after tying my camel and trusting in Allah, then it was nothing I could do about it. But the believer is always asked to act and fight qadr, meaning the neck the the negative aspects as they unfold. If they unfold after doing our best, so be it. So we are not fatalists, for sure. The Quran doesn't accept, ex expect that from the believer by any measure, by any means. But it does expect us that when hit by a calamity, not to lose it, nor to have resentment against Allah, and nor to be resentful towards others, but just get on responsibly with life. In fact, more than that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, even if you feel life is a bit like Sisyphus pushing, up the, pushing that boulder uphill, because I am not rich, I am not able to go on, on holidays whenever I want. I am not able to do this. I can't do that. I am struggling. I am trying to keep my head above water. And whatever else most people are going through today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you realize that Sisyphus, if Sisyphus was a Muslim, if Sisyphus was a believer, he would have known that it's not tragedy, it's not Greek tragedy that he has to push the, uh, the boulder up the hill only for it to roll down, push it up again and never reaches the summit. He would have realized if he was a believer that the joy lies in doing the task. For the believer, for the Muslim, if he is wealthy, she is wealthy, alhamdulillah. If not, alhamdulillah. The case of the believer is always wonderful. The case of the believer, as the Prophet ﷺ said, is always blessed. And that is only the case of the believer. Why? Because they understand living life itself is the extraordinary bit. Living life itself is the glamorous bit. Regardless of what we achieve or not, being Muslim with Iman, is glamorous. It's an achievement for Ibn Allah. Maintaining just a basic marriage and family, especially in this day and life, is an extraordinary achievement. Happiness doesn't lie in some kind of, yes, I'm kind of working 24 7 on my Bitcoin pouch or wallet, and once it grows or whatever, whatever, then I'll be happy. Happiness is. Wow, someone has been reading fairy stories. Wallahi, someone has been reading fairy stories. They haven't been reading the book of Allah. The book of Allah says just in your ordinary life of prayer, of faith, of charity, of family life, 
of friends, of doing good, of seeing, of, of wishing well for others, of seeing the earth grow in awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that is the believer's happiness. When the believer is confronted with the temptation of sin, at some point it's a, a tough battle. And quite often that battle, sometimes that battle can be uh, distasteful, it can be sour and hard. But then Allah, one of the greatest gifts God gives us, is He says to the believing man or woman, the mujahadatun nafs, the spiritual struggle against your soul and against the temptations of sin, you will find halawat al iman, sweetness of iman, sweetness of faith in the battle. And then when we, are, when we do have a skirmish with our nafs, our nafs is saying, Go for the haram, go for the haram. The angelic voice inside of us is saying, don't do the haram, don't get on the wrong side of Allah, don't get on the wrong side of God. And there's that battle. And then Allah gives us tawfiq to make the mujahada. No, I'm not going to do the haram. The believer begins to find delight, happiness in those skirmishes, even if they last our entire lives. The believer finds delight in unrolling his or her prayer mat and just saying takbir Allah. But the believer finds delight in just going out and just looking at the way that Allah made the world and say, Subhanallah, glory be to you who just made this enchanted world in the enchanting way it is. The believer finds delight in spiritually growing. I have got a very difficult awkward spouse i'm actually not talking about my life but i have a very difficult awkward spouse either i've got a difficult husband or i've got a difficult wife whatever or i've got a difficult children and rather than resent it's an opportunity for me to grow in patience higher than patience because the ulama generally agree sabr or patience is far is wajib well, is an obligation I have an obligation when faced with a tragedy or a calamity, loss of a loved one, my Bitcoin wallet has disappeared into thin air, or whatever, I failed my exams, whatever it be, I have an obligation to be patient, which means even though there is some disturbance in my heart, I'm upset, I'm angry, the heart is weeping, the heart is, but the tongue and the hands don't do anything that show resentfulness against God. Don't start pulling my hair out, beating my chest, getting all ratty about it, let alone speaking like that, but the heart is disturbed. Higher than sabr is maqam al-rida. Maqam al-rida. The station, the spiritual station of being content. Rida bil qada is the life of kings. Rida bil qada is the life of kings but it's not an obligation it's the sought after goal it's when we have those calamities the same one as when we were having patience but allah puts into my heart a type of stillness a type of stillness that you know what i did my best to avoid it but it still happened there is some good that i have yet to realize or that is yet to occur in my life from Allah, but didn't my prophet say the case of the believer is always wonderful and I have no doubt about the words of as sadiq al-Ameen as sadiq al-Ameen as sadiq al-Ameen sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam the trustworthy and the most truthful, eminent, truthful person the case of the believer is always wonderful and so we live amidst tribulations and turmoils and everything else kicking off but the heart is still, it's responsible, but it's still, it's not agitated and it goes through life doing whatever it needs to do, but knowing that everything is always, always, always in Allah's hands and never does he lose control of anything, not even for a single moment. And it is when the believer connects with the Lord of all of that is when we become believers whose case will always be wonderful. So for us, pushing the boulder up the hill, knowing it's probably going to roll down, is actually joy of life because Allah loves that we push the boulder, whether it gets up the hill or not. It's the pushing 
that counts. It's the labor of love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves from us despite the outcome. If we can get back to thinking as the Quran wants us to think, if we can get our hearts beating in the way that the Prophet ﷺ taught the heart to beat, we won't fall prey to these lies and these myths. And every day will be a day which we voice the praises and the glory of Allah. And not just the tongue, but the heart says, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa akhir da'wana and Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا لا يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد يا أيها الناس اتقوا الله فإن تقوى رأس كل شيء اتقوا الله وراقبوه واعتيوه Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reminded us, O believers, to fear him and to be conscious of him and to be mindful of him throughout our lives. Remember that the divine gaze is ever watching us in private and in public. Remember the divine gaze doesn't just see our outward limbs or our outward appearances, but the divine gaze penetrates our skins, our hearts and our very thoughts. So let us have a healthy fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hope in his forgiveness and mercy and seek to be loved by him and love him. That is really the life of a believer. That is the way we push the boulder up the hill. That is the way that we are Muslim Sisyphus. And with that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alayhim rahmah, alayhim salawat, upon them will be Allah's blessings, upon us will be Allah's mercy. And Allah will choose us and make us celebrities in heaven. Because when Allah loves someone, many of you will recall that the Prophet said in the Sahih Hadith in Sahih Muslim, when Allah loves someone, he says to the angel Gabriel, O oh, Jibreel, alayhi salam, I love such and such, you too love that person. And, get, and Gabriel loves that person. And then Gabriel comes to the rest of the heavens and the angels, and he says, O oh, angels of heaven, Allah loves that person. Mentioned by name. Mentioned by name. Allah loves that person. And I love that person. You too love that, per that person. And the angels all love that person. And the love of him or her filters down to some hearts on earth. To be loved by Allah, to be mentioned by Him, by name by Him, to be loved by the highest assembly of angels, to be loved by the angels in heaven. What can the earth give us? What can modernity offer us in exchange for that? Absolutely nothing. So we get our bearings right. We put the, the qibla of our heart correct. The qibla of our body is southeast. Makkah, al muqarrama the qibla of our heart is always Allah Jalla Jalalu. Allahumma a'izz al Islam wal Muslimin. Allahumma a'izz al Islam wal Muslimin. Allahumma rabbana atin fi dunya hasana wa fi al akhirati hasana wa qina adha banna. Subhana rabbi karabbi al izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al Muslimin. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa akimu salat. <coughs>